Okay, so we'll get started. Thank you again for everyone for joining us today. Uh, my name is Jane Benbrew and I'm the Logistics Lead at Toronto Outdoor Art Fair. And I would like to welcome everyone to uh, today's webinar, Glimpsing the Future, Volume 2, brought to you by the PowerPoint Contemporary Art Gallery. TUAF is excited to be able to transition a digital platform and be able to help us engage not only with our guests, but also our visitors we would normally see at Nathan Phillips Square. I'd like to remind all of our attendees that this webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing tomorrow on our YouTube channel. The chat function has been disabled for this webinar, but attendees are welcome to submit questions in the Q&A section. Our fair is open uh, to artists at all stages of their careers, including student and emerging artists. We're committed to supporting the next generation artists by offering affordable opportunities and providing educational workshops to set them up for success. Each year, we run several workshops to support artists each step of the way, from submitting strong applications to, to preparing for sales, marketing, curation, and self-care during an outdoor art fair. One story is of artist Kate McLean, who participated in TOAF for the first time this summer after graduating from OCAD U in 2016. In the course of three days, Kate went from having just a few collectors to a body of over 30 loyal collectors who have closely followed her career since. This direct access between artists and the public without, their, without the need for gallery representation creates a viable economic platform for artists to celebrate their entrepreneurial spirit. It makes the artistic practice financially viable and nurtures their career growth by establishing opportunities for discovery and recognition. On behalf of Toronto Outdoor Art Fair, I would like to welcome our moderator, Laura Demers, TD Curator of Education and Public Programs at the Power Plant Contemporary Art Gallery. Laura, along with our six panelists, will We'll discuss their artwork, style, and process in a rapid fire style presentation. Laura? Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, first of all, I'd like to, thanks, uh, to thank all the folks at TOAF who have made this program possible uh, once again this year under challenging circumstances. Um, the Power Plan is so grateful to and, be thr and thrilled to be part of this collaboration. Uh, we initiated Glimpsing the Future at TOAF last year, where we invited emerging artists to present Petra Kucha style presentations and artist talks. Uh, this year we're repeating the program and are offering the mic to six artists uh, to present their creative practices using only 10 to 14 slides and speaking only for 30 seconds per slide. So we're in for a ride. Uh, without further ado, I would like to briefly introduce our first speaker. Valentine Brown creates soft body horror using mixed media images and sculpture. Valentine pieces together a gaze that is trans, trauma-informed, and on the autism spectrum. In 2019, Valentine was awarded the Wanley Fellowship, the Intergenerational LGBT Artist Residency, and exhibited his first solo show, Body Farm, with Tangled Art Plus Disability. For this presentation, Valentine has prepared an image description document, which you can use to follow along as needed. The video will also be available on YouTube as of July 10th. Over to you, Valentine. Thanks, Laura. So like Laura said, I've prepared some image descriptions um, that you can follow along with. As such, I will be announcing my slides as I advance them for those who are familiar. I describe my work as soft body horror, which there are three words that describe my experience as trans, autistic, and traumatized. Each of these experiences are connected by my body and by a sense of being in between. The body farm is how I make sense of this. Slide two. On the body farm, things are not organized in terms of linear time or space because that's not how I find them. I can, however, tell you how the body farm first revealed itself. Around the time I started my medical transition in 2017, I kept a notebook that I called my chapter blog, where I wrote just brief notes about the things that I did every day. Over time, I started drawing in these notebooks as well. Slide two. Over the next year, I made over 100 drawings, which became more and more involved. The writing also changed 
it be, became part of the lens through which I understand. I didn't write about any particular moment in my life. I wrote about the body. A place where meaning and matters more than content. Slide four. Over the summer of 2018, I returned to a project that I started when I was in school. This work is called Unidentified Remains, and it was part of a group exhibit by Art Spin called Holding Pattern, a 20 project show um, that animated a series of storage shows. Unidentified Remains consists of 1,000 small, unfired clay objects which expressed my experience of belonging and alienation. During the show, several visitors asked to be able to touch the work, and I was very happy to allow them to do so. Slide five. At the beginning of 2019, I found myself, I found myself with hundreds of pages of writing and drawing and over a thousand cultural objects, and I wanted to connect with it. That is when I started working with angled art accessibility, where I found that accessibility is the thing that ties my work together and makes it body. The first step in moving forward was making paintings from the drawings that I had made the previous year through digitally assembled compositions. Slide six. Over the, given that this body of work contains so many pieces, it made sense to make an audio description of the more abstract one. So building on the aesthetic and narrative that I created with the original captive work, I was able to convey the soul of the work without having to describe each piece individually. The captain's log became a series of short entries that amounted to only about 20 minutes of audio. The text was also printed on vinyl, which were interspersed with the images. Slide seven. The text and audio of the log is presented chronologically out of order as a reflection of the relationship between trauma and memory, and my experience of processing trauma as a mythical journey where meaning matters more than, quote, unquote, the fact. Over the next few slides, I will describe one image two ways, one with a captain's log and two with a more literal um, interpretation of the image. Slide eight, captain's log, January 18th, 2020. Inhaling the sharp smell of your emerald green sharpie, you write, unknown specimen on the side of a plastic sample tree. This is the one hundred sample of unidentified remains that you found again in the body. Ninety-nine peanut butter jars lying along covered in a base far away from you. You sense that inside this one hundred jar there is a fire that will never be. Slide nine. This image depicts a mixed media drawing. The drawing is of a peanut butter jar with a green label. The jar is drawn in marker with wobbly lines. Interspersed with the image of the peanut butter, like a double exposure, is a plant-like form with many stems and green stems that look in Framing the jar of peanut butter, there is undulating text that reads, who are you holding? Slide 10. Stepping back to unidentified remains, which are such touchable objects, I decided to expand their tactile contribution to the body farm by exploring soft sculpture. So naturally, I made a 12-foot monster um, that I call Big Softy, um, which I made from a quilt uh, made from those that I wore when I was a girl as well as, well as other um, materials. Slide 11. 
As visitors interact with big softies and the remains, the object shifts over time, revealing that big softie is fragmented. Big softie is torn limb from limb, guts splayed open, as an expression of how trauma has affected and transmitted. At the same time, embedded inside of big softie are several dog toys that we can offer as a way of reflecting the sense of whimsy that I frame experience. Slide 12. I use text in my work, and the words release me appear repeatedly on the body. The text loosely resembles diagrams to express my experience of being apologized by the checklist and diagnoses used by the healthcare system. I repeat the words release me because I experience trauma as pent up survival energy trapped inside my body. Slide 13. So through my work with Tangled, I presented Body Farm as a multi sensory experience by leaving accessibility directly into the world. I assert that disability contributes to culture and exists outside of medical understanding. Sean Lee says it best when he says, people always think of art as being good for disability, but I think that disability is good for art. Slide 14. One thing that I think about is how my work is informed by how I process trauma as a trans and autistic person, and how some of that work is facilitated by which harkens back to the idea of disability art in the context of our therapy that comes full circle by asserting my autonomy as an artist. I will close with this drawing that I made of my future self that I collaborated on with my therapist um, to imagine this dialogue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valentine. That was uh, that was amazing. Um, I really like that last drawing as well. Projecting yourself into the future—that's that's beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, without uh, waiting, up next is Bruce Horak. Horak is a legally blind performer creator who lost over ninety percent of his eyesight to cancer as a baby. His work seeks to express the unique way he sees the world through visual art, performance, storytelling, and music. He delights in shifting his own perspective and the perspectives of his audience. Please welcome Bruce. Hello, am I unmuted? Yes, you're fine. <laughs> Great, and there's an image being shown? Perfect. Yeah, uh, um, thank did you. you want to share your screen as well? Yes, I do. Wish me luck, okay. everyone. Okay. Uh, is that going? Do you see Glimpsing the Future? Yeah. Perfect. Oh, wow, <laughs> this, this is great. Uh, all my nerves are now quashed. Uh, a couple of things I'd like to say off the top. First of all, a huge thank you to Jane and Laura uh, for today. And uh, I also would love to, uh, to echo what Valentin said and, and a big thanks to Sean Lee at Tangled Art and Disability. Uh, this is um, this has been a real dream of mine, and things are are rocking. Uh, I do have to also mention there's a couple of images from which I mislabeled uh, in the slide presentation coming up. That's uh, to give some credit to Michelle Peak Photography and Bodies in Translation. That is all of my introduction. I'll just leap in uh, with this. As was mentioned in the introduction, um, I do have nine percent eyesight due to a childhood cancer called bilateral retinoblastoma. My visual field is restricted by the fact that I have only one eye. And the eye that I do have is further restricted by a covering of scar tissue over the retina and a cataract which, which uh, resulted from the radiation treatment I underwent as an infant. Now my creative practice, the entire creative practice that I've been undertaking uh, since I was a kid has been to express how it is I see the world. I believe if eyesight is, a, is the tool, vision is how you use it. This piece is called Through a Tired Eye. On a good day, I see through a mass of vitreous floaters, moving chunks in my already limited visual field, which my brain edits out. When I'm tired, they become more pronounced and hard to ignore. 
Now this canvas had been stapled up in my studio for some time and was starting to really irritate me. So I set up my camera, pointed it at the canvas, loaded up my brush with paint and started to chase my floaters, making as much of a mess as I felt like. If you ever get a chance to throw paint around like this, I highly recommend it. What you're seeing is a time lapse of the process. A painting of trees is covered until it is completely obscured in an abstracted mess resembling how it is I see the world. There's so much to look at in this big, beautiful world that my one good eye is usually flicking around spasmodically in an attempt to take it all in. This next slide is of a tactile landscape I created called New Brunswick Grove at Night. It towers over the viewer and is meant to be touched. The acrylic paint feels substantial and yet has some give to it, rough and abrasive in points, smooth and subtle in others. I've used black light, glow in the dark, and iridescent paints throughout so that the work changes considerably in response to different lighting. At a distance, it might look like a mass of trees, it might look like lightning, it might look like neurons firing, or it might look great on your wall. The next slide is an entry I made with the help of Tangled Art and Disability Gallery into the COVID Public Art Project in Toronto. The question posed by the Bentway Conservancy was, what are the words you are living by right now during this time of pandemic? The image is covered in a few hundred tiny spiraling lines, all hand drawn. Now, if you have an astigmatism like I do, this will really mess with it. The image may appear to vibrate. The spiraling lines come together at center to spell the word able. Able is a word I love. I think of it like a challenge, like uh, shouting on guard at the beginning of a duel. I think of this work whenever I start a new project. And on some days that project is simply getting out of bed. The next slide is an image of me standing in front of 200 eight inch by 10 inch canvases displayed in a huge grid on a wall at the Kelowna Art Gallery. Each, canva uh, each canvas contains a hand painted acrylic portrait of a different person. Each portrait took between one and three hours to complete and was done from an in-person sitting. I started this series in 2011 with friends and family and then began to move my circle ever outward. I've been living, working, and thriving out of a backpack for 10 years now, calling myself a hobo sapien. I've just completed my 600th portrait. Every 100 portraits, I do a selfie. And since I've been sheltering in place since March, it seemed appropriate that number 600 should be done now. Number 600. This is a digital work created on my iPad. Now when I sit with a subject, I usually start with a question and that's, how do you describe yourself to someone who cannot see? The answers I've gotten have been absolutely fantastic. One of the best description that, uh, that I've ever heard, I heard a couple of weeks ago and it sums this gentleman up perfectly. Mr. Sheldon Elter, he said, when I smile, I show the world all of my teeth, even my molars. This is portrait number 599, Mr. Sheldon Elter. Now, since COVID, I've moved my practice online and have sat with people from all over the world. I sit with my subjects over Zoom or FaceTime and what have you, and we catch up or get to know each other. And I have been made richer by this experience in, and by this practice than any miser in a golden tower. I believe I expand through my connections. When I'm disconnected, I am contracting, getting smaller. My worldview and experience is closed. Turning within is no longer growth. So I strive to connect. I have had my mind blown, my preconceptions and prejudices shattered, my faith and hope restored, and my love bolstered. I've just painted my 600th portrait and I cannot see myself ever stopping this practice. Nothing makes me more full of joy and wonder than to sit with someone and bring something beautiful into the world together. If the, beauty su if the painting sucks, well, maybe we had some laughs, but you never know. Now, the title of this gathering is Glimpsing the Future. And when I think of glimpsing the future, I have to chuckle. See, the, the word glimpsing makes me think of a fractured or partial view of something. And as a legally blind individual, I have some experience in that realm. But as for the future, well, I don't know. Maybe we're all just moving into it right about now. But personally, I love to think about the future. It gives me hope. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bruce. Um, that was so generous of you to, to share all of, the, all of that. Um, and it's so fascinating to see the, the progression from portrait number one to portrait 600 now. Thank you. Um, <laughs> um, so next up is Alejandro Rizzo Nervo. 
Alejandro is a visual artist whose practice is based in photography, collage, photo montage, and non-traditional printing processes. He was born in Venezuela and immigrated to Toronto in 2014. He was the recipient of a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Photography from OCAD University in 2019. He has participated in multiple group exhibitions in Canada and Italy, and he is currently completing a postgraduate degree in project management. Welcome, Alejandro. Thank you, Laura, for that introduction. Can you hear me? And you can see the slides, right? Okay. Yeah. Hello, all. Um, I would like to open up. I have been working on a specific project for the past two years titled Fabricated Realities where I challenge the capabilities of documentary photography across borders. In this work, I look to my lineage by digitally, create, digitally creating images of the political, social, and economic crisis in my home country of Venezuela. I'm an artist to reflect on Venezuela as a now immigrant in Canada, while also mourning displacement as an outsider. In a manipulated born out of my own knowledge and experience recited, residing in Venezuela, I am creating a body of work that aims to inform the viewer rather than explicitly offer an opinion on the depicted issue. As an artist affected by migration and displacement, I constantly dwell on how I can contribute and what I can do to not just stay quiet. In this untitled work, you're presented with imagery that reflects on the lack of products available in stores, supermarkets, and overall, a failure in the Venezuelan economy, resulting in endless lineups to obtain the simplest of products, including food, medicine, and any other everyday basic needs. You can also observe how cars are being pushed into a gas station as a way to represent the lack of gas in an oil-producing country. In a country where harsh, strict censorship is present, traditional media channels such as TV and radio are completely censored and controlled by a government that is not interested in the well-being of its citizens. We depend on social media networks in order to get unfiltered updates from Venezuela. This project has allowed me to question documentation ethics, as well as how media channels portray and disseminate information. Some questions definitely arise, Will my practice survive the questionable indexicality of my gaze? How can I insert my experience without including an opinion? Am I behaving like a media channel by deciding what is acceptable to be shown? These are definitely questions that are always present in my mind. In this work, Hyperinflation, I created a scene that depicts workers of a mint, overproducing money. And this has been a tactic that has been often been used in Venezuela as a way to counterattack the prices of goods. As prices goes up, bills are not enough to pay them. In this case, the government decides to print more bills. And as a result, hyperinflation occurs. A basic economic concept, the more money you print, the less, va the less value money will have. In a country where soldiers damage take control by force, and actively hold no respect towards its citizens, I present to the viewers a depiction of the military service stomping on books. It is a metaphor to reflect on their lack of acknowledgement to history, knowledge, and peace. This is an image that resonates on multiple levels to contemporary and past issues universally. The digital features of this body of work have allowed the work to maintain a serious political tone, while also making it manageable for an inexperienced audience. The cartoonish composition is used as a tactic to alleviate the seriousness of hardship portrayed in the images. In this specific one, I present to the viewers a depiction of a student protest in the city of Caracas, <coughs> activities that I have personally participated in and where I have witnessed terrorizing events. Contextualizing foreign subjects on site. Now, one of the biggest concerns I had while starting this work was how could I help an inexperienced audience to truly grasp and understand the severity of what was displayed in front of them? I thought maybe I can create juxtapositions of here and there. 
And I achieved that by placing two currencies along each other, equating in value. You can observe a Canadian penny surrounded by thousands of bolivares, which is the Venezuelan currency. This image reflects on early 2019, where the individual on top of the mountain was attempting to bring change and freedom to Venezuela. He was supported for a good while and placed on a pedestal by those who did so. Represented by people protesting in favor of the current government, as well as people representing the opposition. I have broken down the print in several parts for you to grasp on the many details that make up this large work. This print sums up the struggle, happiness, false hopes that were made one year ago. This work is accompanied by the sounds of a protest as an attempt to create a space where the viewer fully engages with what is presented to them. I will now play a clip of the sound. It might be a little loud. Now, in this image, you can observe the moment where I realized that someone had committed the act of vandalization on my work. This happened during an exhibition that took place last summer, and I could not be happier than it happened. Normally, I would have gotten upset, but the idea that my work had created such an emotion to lead someone to glue a piece of paper to my work, damaging it and changing it forever was just fascinating. It provided me with more validation to why this work is so important to be made. Lastly, this body of work has challenged the ways I treat art and it has allowed me to extend the purpose it should have. It is the result of my own experience plus a wide range of conversations throttled by research that supports the visual imagery presented. I plan on taking this project into my master's studies in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alejandro. Um, yeah, that works also is amazing. Um, I love how detailed these prints are. Um, our next presenter is Claire Brown, who graduated from OCAD University in 2015 with a Bachelor of Fine Art in Drawing and Painting. Her practice focuses on landscape and the deep connection that people have between land, heritage, and self-identity. Through painting the Caribbean country St. Vincent and the Grenadines, Claire explores her own family's histories, travels, displacement, and adaptation to new lands and cultural spaces. All yours, Claire. Thank you. Bringing myself back to where I want to be. Okay. So yes, my name is Claire, and to begin with slide one here, uh, titled What Was My Grandmother's House? I found my artistic voice during my final year of undergrad, during a time of great distress and unrequited longing for people and a place that I could not easily access. About halfway through my year of study, I was made aware that my grandmother's health was in decline. This grandmother lived in the Caribbean on the island of St. Vincent, and I couldn't hop on a plane. There was technology to communicate, but there existed a number of limitations. A cultural language barrier that had always existed between us as our respective accents and vocabulary could make it often feel like we were speaking two different languages. I longed for a place which I had only visited a handful of times, for spaces that I felt I was still becoming acquainted with and which were so wrapped up in the idea of my grandmother, the last real authentic link to this other country. My grandmother would die on January of 2015 and I would return to the island of St. Vincent for her funeral. With a heightened awareness of the distance I was experiencing with this space. Slide two, the accident. I was creating paintings from photographs I took while in St. Vincent and the Grenadines and was inspired by places of great importance such as my grandmother's house as featured in the previous slide or of events that marked me as important. In a moment of chaotic excitement, I took a snapshot out of my car window of a crowd of people. Once closer to the scene, I was made aware that this was a car accident. A driver had run off the road and down the cliff. 
all around me, locals gathered, conversing, and undoubtedly waiting for some authority to arrive. I was made so painfully aware of my being an outsider, no idea of who I would call in an emergency, where I even was in the context of a map. I was truly watching, helpless, confronted by the invisible barriers of visiting the country of my ancestors. Slide three, Ultramarine Spectre. My interest in painting St. Vincent continued as I considered what it means to paint a space that I know through story and through minimal interaction, which exists sometimes more so in my imagination or faded memory than in the real world. I was interested in painting the spaces of the island and the types of architecture that is found there. I painted this image because of the romantic feeling I got seeing this abandoned house on the side of the road of a busy intersection, right at the heart of a roundabout. It would have been full of life, had a history, but the space had been abandoned. I imagine that the spirit of these lost years still lingered, and I mapped stories of my father's childhood onto this space. In painting the structure, I hope to allow other stories to emerge. Slide four, house in the valley. I returned again and again to buildings I saw during my visits to St. Vincent, places that I didn't know intimately for which I built stories to create intimacy with the place as quickly as possible during these short stays. My paintings of these structures often referenced architectural elements specific to the place, but also would not have an exactitude as I was not precisely aware of the particulars of these buildings. I am still an outsider after all. These studies of place were reminders of my lack of intimate knowledge. The result would be the idea of the place intertwined with a real world location, which I attempted to document with a camera and which I then digested through paint. Slide five, Blue Island one. My gaze moved from structures to the land eventually. Existence within a colonial space was always present in the work, and when you're on an island that exists as it does because of the slave trade and as a former colony. I was thinking of my own sense of awe and excitement in returning to this, this space and this place, what this land meant to my ancestors and what it would mean to me in this context today. Slide six, salt ponds. Interest in the land, and in the island meant also considering specific forms of plant life and geography. In the case of the painting salt ponds, I was looking to make some specific reference to location. The salt ponds are a naturally occurring basins of water that allow for the sea to collect and the water to evaporate. So the heightened salination creates really um, excellent swimming pools to enjoy, but equally according to the local population, this would have been a space to harvest salt. Um, so again, this, this space existed as a coming together of what the space exists as now as a place of perhaps relaxation and joy, um, and that there is still a at least oral history of a time of work that was previously attributed. Slide seven, crimson plant study. Botanical studies became a focus as I continued to consider the colonial histories of uprooting and transplanting. This included people and the botanical world. With each new world that was exploited, specimens of plants were collected and transported from place to place without any acknowledgement of the traditional names or uses of these species. Slide eight, shadow play two. Thinking about the impact of movement, of transplanting and moving, I thought of the remnants left behind, or the artifacts, which led to an interest in the imagery and concept of shadows, intangible proof of an object's presence. The form and concept of the shadows left behind was of interest because they are moving and changing. They are present, but are not a physical presence. Slide nine and thurium shadow play. I love my potted plants and I enjoy their beauty, the structural form, and they make great painting subjects. 
uh, but the reason and history for how we managed to cultivate these plants and why they have Latin or Greek names is because of these colonial histories. They embody involuntary migrations of being uprooted and transplanted elsewhere, yet still retaining beauty and managing to thrive. Slide 10, cane begonia. The begonia is one of my favorite plants, its structure and gorgeous flowers, and I created this piece in pursuit of my interest in botanical forms. But the choice was also spurred by the name of this plant, begonia, a name chosen by a French botanist to honor the governor of Saint Domingue, which is now known as Haiti. We're surrounded by legacies of colonial pasts in the words that we use and the histories that are shared. I may never know what the name of this plant was before, and a lot of the knowledge has been lost, making it more important to continue to investigate what it is that we don't know. I'm gonna end it there. Thank you so much, uh, Claire. Um, our next speaker was unable to join us today, but she has given me um, her notes and her presentation. So I will speak on her behalf. So you can imagine that I'm Karina. Uh, Karina Iskandarja is an Indonesian visual artist and curator whose work highlights cultural hybridity and the experience and histories of ge geographically displaced individuals. She, uh, she holds an MFA in criticism and curatorial practice from OCAD University. Karina currently works at Trinity Square Video, the Riverdale Hub, and Glory Hole Gallery for two-spirited LGBTQ plus artists. Welcome Karina, but I'm Karina today. So I'm hoping that this works fine for everyone. So this image is from 2014 when I was in Singapore doing my undergrad. With, with Standing is the first show I put together with a group of like-minded classmates. We were young artists starving for space to create and share artworks living in an island nation that had, heavily, um, had heavy censorship laws and permit restrictions. So when we found an empty storage room in an old school campus, we took it. Withstanding was about tension, which we felt a lot of during this time. While we were being educated in the traditions of Western art, we were dealing with the social realities of a conservative, youth, uh, conservative South Asian nation where being homosexual was punishable by law. Living as an artist in Singapore for me meant finding alternative spaces where we could be loud, queer, radical, and critical of our environment but still fly under the radar of the government's eye. This image is from a group, group show called Easy Come, Easy Go, which I co-curated with a local artist, Kai Chan, inside of, inside of Har, Hapar Villa, uh, Villa Park. Hapar Villa is an old sculpture theme park built by the man who made Tiger Balm. At the time, much of the park was under renovation. Kai Chan, rented one of the commercial pavilions at a low price, and for a little while we had this small gallery space inside of a huge and scary sculpture park. Easy Come, Easy Go alluded to the transient, transient spaces of Singapore and was an ode to the histories that keep getting paved over in favor of heteropatriarchal hypercapitalism. My interest in alternative spaces and the liminal continued when I moved to Toronto. This is an installation called Istana Batik on some stairs. On the vertical surface is a picture of the Istana or castle, a British colonial building in Singapore. And on the horizontal surface are different cultural variants of batik, which are wax printed patterns on cloth with Indonesian origins. Both the histories of Istana and production of batik complicate the colonizer colonized dynamic which in reality is much less dichotomous than we usually think. Although this was supposed to be a temporary installation for a school project, you can still see it today on the sixth floor of OCAD's uh, 205 Richmond building. Someone who has lived most of her life as a foreigner in various countries 
my complicated history with migration affects everything I do. The project titled Anthem was in hindsight, a kind of therapy for the bullying I kept experiencing from border guards. This is an, ex an interpretive work, interactive work in which you're able to apply for a handmade fake prized Canadian passport. But first you must fill out an application form and contribute your own version of the Canadian national anthem. Displayed on the wall next to the, to the desk are passports from previous applicants with their lyrics printed on the notebook. You can also view these lyrics from an iPad mounted on the wall. It plays an instrumental melody of the anthem and participants are encouraged to sing along using the collection of new lyrics. In 2018, I was involved in a group show with Glory Hole Gallery, a queer art space co-founded by one of my peers at OCAD, Emily Peltier. Then in 2019, I joined the small collect collective and we have been programming queer Toronto arts since. Although we manage to occasionally find space for full scale exhibitions and events, the gallery itself is a series of 12 by 12 inches boxes with a, uh, with a peephole, hence the glory hole. Glory Hole Gallery is an alternative space with a capital A and, um, and was the result of a lack of funds and permanent spaces dedicated to queer artists. I'm going to end with this last project uh, titled Bugai Street. Bugai Street is a neighborhood in Singapore with, which was once home to a lively international trans queer community from the 1950s to the 80s. In the mid 80s, Bugai Street was wiped and underwent major urban redevelopment. Archival documentations of this place and time are integrated into a batik pattern overlain with a Wayang shadow puppet motif, which in Singaporean slang means to pretend or to act. Um, in this work, Wayang alludes to the Singaporean um, government's denial of important LGBT Q histories, but also a method of survival for the community. This is an ongoing design series that applies a pattern design commemorating an important queer history on unexpected everyday surfaces and objects as a gesture of assertion. Since moving to Toronto about the weight of censorship laws, I've discovered that my voice is, is able, uh, I've discovered what my voice is able to do, how loud and powerful it can be but I am left continually drawn to my scattered roots in Southeast Asia and the queer and feminist struggles that I left behind but refused to abandon. Um, thank you so much, Karina, for sharing your slides with me and for allowing me to speak on your behalf. Um, I think your practice is really interesting and um, it's unfortunate that you weren't able to, um, to join us, but um, I'm glad we were able to show your work nonetheless. Um, and then last but not least, uh, Yao Tony. Tony is a designer and artist who is trained in architecture, graphic design, and fine art. He also works in product design and creative consulting. In 2018, he was the cover feature of Design Lines. Yao Tony is the founder of LLIM, Textiles and Visual Communication Art Projects. His, uh, his artistic practice is deeply based in the refinement of use of colors its reconnection to humanity and its impact on human behavior. Please welcome Yao Tony. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, how's everyone doing? Uh, my name is Yao Tony, as, um, as I've been introduced, and I want to welcome everybody to the talk. Um, I'll just give a quick uh, introduction to the new work that I've been doing, all the work that I've been doing, and I'll just go through some of the slides, uh, some of my artwork with you. Uh, there are always two meanings to my artwork, plus the meaning that the viewer always give. Um, so I treat art as a, as a proverb, as a parable. I use them as allegories, storytelling. Um, I use characters and objects, uh, and I use a lot of colors to, as, as a means of communication too, and influence mood. Uh, the characters that I use are, the characters and the colors that I use are the subject, but my core principle in all my work 
is to influence the viewer that in every follower there's a hidden leader and that is yet to discover themselves so my work uh focus more of uh self-discovery um this piece is called uh flying turtle um which i extract from uh, a Ghanaian adage it says that when god wants to give a turtle a gift he doesn't put it in the sky uh, enforces the idea that a man's gift uh, makes room for him and uh, your value is in the gift that you possess. Um, uh, this I also use art uh, not as a pursuit and to capture and freeze beauty, but also to paint ideas and thoughts and um, questions of life such as who am I, uh, where, am I where am I from, uh, why am I here, um, what can I do? Where am I going? I feel like uh, I've come to understand that these five questions in life are responsible for all the corruptions in the world. They are responsible for all the good in the world. They are responsible for our behaviors and our characters. Um, this piece is called The Waters on My Knee. It, it, it enforces the idea that purpose determines design and design uh, uh, determines function. Uh, the monkey is designed with the ability to be able to climb on to the top of the tree. The uh, giraffe is designed with the ability to reach the top of the tree with its height. Uh, the story behind this is that the giraffe uh, is standing in the water. The monkey asks the giraffe, how deep is the water? Uh, the giraffe said, the water is at, at my knee. Uh, the monkey jumped into the water and he almost drowned. Uh, this piece is called, what would you do? Um, it is inspired by a statement that I heard that it was very profound when I heard it at that time because it was a new concept to me. Uh, it says that design is predictable and failure is predictable um, to enforce the idea that success in life is a result of decision and failure in life is a result of the, the, the uh, decision and everyone becomes what they decide to become. Um, so I put it in, into an artwork based on uh, a story that I, a, a story that I heard from Ghana. This piece is called um, "Find Your Gift." Um, I strongly believe that there's a gift in everyone, or there's a talent in everyone that is powerful enough to uh, to influence the world to a better place. Um, I believe that you are your raw material. I believe that everything that you are supposed to become is already trapped in you, just like how. Uh, a forest is trapped in the seed of a, of a tree. Um, one of the reasons why this piece means a lot to me is that everybody's born with a gift. Uh, you never gave yourself the gift. Your parents never gave yourself that gift. So the question is who gave you the gift? Why do you have the gift that you have? And for what purpose of the gift? Uh, this piece is extracted from a Ghanaian adage that says human conscience is God's witness. He speaks on the concept that your ideas are your only currency, meaning that um, you are what you think, you become what you continue to think, and you cannot go above your mental conditioning. So if you want to change the world, if you want to change uh, a person, we have to change the source of where the ideas are coming from. Um, this piece is also extracted from a Ghanaian adage. It is called, uh, a, a woman is a beautiful flower. Um, in Ghanaian culture, there's a lot of there's a lot of use of proverbs uh, that they use to communicate or convey the uh, the concepts to the community, and this one speaks of uh, a woman being a flower in the garden, and it should be loved, cherished, should be adored, cared for, cultivate, protect. It shows the delicate uh, the delicate nature of a woman. This is also coming from a Ghanaian adage uh, title the dancing tree. It speaks on the concept that a tree that doesn't know how to dance will be taught by the wind. Or if um, one tree stands in the path of the wind, it falls, it enforces the idea that one person should not be, uh, should not take everyone's responsibility. Um, these, um, these pieces are extracted from Edin Kant symbols. Edin Kant symbols are uh, they are simple, plain uh, motifs, uh, but yeah, very, um, very impacted with ideas, uh, very intricate expressionism way before the modern movement of expressionism began in the 20th century. 
um, in, in terms of uh, the Western worldview. So edging current symbols are um, used in Africa to represent ideas and concepts. But these, these colorful ones are my interpretation of them in colors because um, I see colors. I see in colors, I should say. Uh, when I close my eyes, uh, I see colors. So what I try to do is uh, transport what I'm seeing in my, in my, in my head into, into artwork. This piece is called Good Friends or Two Good Friends. Uh, so this symbol represents uh, um, friendship. Um, it's, uh, it speaks on the concept that a good friend is worth more than the gold and there's no greater relationship than a true friend. Uh, this piece is called Freedom and it's a symbol of uh, freedom, liberty, and uh, independence. So this is my um, interpretation of it in, in, in use of colors. Uh, this piece is called Talking Drum. Um, so uh, the drum is a, unif a unified element. Um, back in the ancient times, the, uh, the people in, in, in Ghana use uh, talking drums to communicate and convey ideas and messages to the people in the community. Um, this piece is called What I See, I Keep. Uh, so this is a symbol for wisdom, uh, knowledge. So this is my um, colorful interpretation of of the motif. Uh, this piece is called I Shall Marry You. Uh, this is a symbol of commitment and perseverance. So this is my interpretation, uh, interpretation of it in the use of colors. Uh, this piece is called uh, Goodbye. Uh, so there's a symbol of uh, farewell. It plays on the idea that saying farewell to loved ones, thing or place can be very difficult. Uh, but sometimes it is inevitable and it is necessary to prepare yourself uh, to be able to depart or to be able to say farewell to your loved ones. And this is actually my last slide. Um, here are my contact the way you can reach. And Life Living With Me is, um, is, is where you can get all the scarves uh, brand that I've been working on. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Yao. Um, so this wraps up our, our presentations for today. Um, I was kind of hoping to do a brief Q&A. We don't have that much time, so maybe I'll just ask one question and try to kind of package it all and open it up, open it up to all of you at once. Um, and let me just see if we have questions from the audience. I think there's okay. two. Yeah. Okay, so one question was, what has been the reaction to your art in Toronto? And the other, the other question has been, um, do you find that your works are translating well online? Um, and maybe, I guess, with that, maybe like, let's just use the kind of situation with the whole, the whole, you know, sharing things online and what this pandemic has brought us, is, you know, in terms of um, shifting our, our gears a little bit. Um, so I'm wondering if you could, if you could each tell us in about one sentence or two sentences about something that has piqued your curiosity during this time or something that whether, you know, whether it be an idea to explore or um, a new material that you want to experiment with or another artist that you might be um, inspired by um, and whether the sort of digital component also takes part of that. Uh, given, you know, the pandemic and how we've kind of all been um, trying to negotiate life uh, virtually. So basically, it's a big question, but um, I'll just open it up to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the use of, uh, I think art online is, I mean, it's very useful because it, it enables all of us to be able to reach people that we would normally not reach on a regular basis. Um, and, um, yeah, it's quite interesting. Most of, most of the people that respond to my artwork, uh, not mainly from Toronto per se, but they're somewhere in England, somewhere in the States. So I think, uh, the virtual way of going about it is, is helpful to artists, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll hop in next, but uh, it has been interesting kind of knowing, at least for the time being, that most of our interactions with art 
are going to be in a digital space. Um, only because I, I find that, especially if you're using kind of more traditional art making mediums like paint or, or even if it's something more subtle like drawing, um, there can be a want to see the physical material in person. At least I find that there's usually an added element of a visual that you get when you see something in person and how it interacts with, uh, with the world and with light. Um, however, I mean, the, the ability to, to share your artwork and have it be accessible without having to ask for someone to travel to see your work, I think is always going to be really positive. Yeah. Because up until now, there, there has always existed that just the physical barrier of having to go out to these shows to see work. Um, and not everyone would have access once upon a time. So I think it, it opens up people to artwork in a way that wouldn't have existed before now. Totally. Um, there's a really interesting question here for Alejandro. In Ascension, you showed someone had defaced your work by adding a sticker that said, uh, uh, Guido Innocent, an American puppet. This message is in English, not in Spanish. Do you feel this invalidates the questioning of your work as the person who does not try to represent themselves as Hispanic? Or I guess what, also, what is your what was your reaction to that? Did you end up leaving the sticker, or did you did you choose to remove it, or what was your um, how did you kind of navigate that situation? So basically, when I realized that the piece of paper had been glued onto it. It wasn't just a sticker per se, it was chopped paper, glued, and then, you know, like mm. kind of pasted on it. Um, I did try in the beginning to remove it, but it was just tearing up the print. So I just decided to naturally let it change and, uh, you know, transform into what this, uh, what the body, uh, what, the, what the print is now right like the print does not represent the same message or meaning that it did before the um vandalization of the work now going back to um validation or invalidation of what was commented i think it all goes back to um exercising freedom of, of speech which is something that it's very important for me regardless of where it's coming from if it's coming from a point of view where the person is you know, they fully know what is going on, or maybe they don't really know, but there's an opinion that they want to voice. I think that's always going to be important. And it's exercising the freedom of speech, right? That that's, that's crucial for me growing in a place where censorship was everywhere. And, you know, the, I, I grew up with the fear of, of having uh, an opinion. So <clears throat> being in Canada where people can say what they feel, that's, I think, that's very successful to me. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, there's also a question for Valentin. Um, the question is, you said that the body farm had its beginnings in your journal entries about daily events and then grew into descriptions of the body farm. Um, I'm assuming they're, t they're talking about the captain's log here. Have you or would you revisit those earlier journal entries and reshape them into entries in the captain's log? So I guess are you do you revisit entries in the in the, in the captain's log is the question. Not in like a super direct way. Um, in my trauma work, I'm always revisiting um, the different places in my life. So in a way, you know, I am revisiting the things that I wrote down. And I'm, I also have my own personal question kind of to riff up on that. Um, I guess you, you gave these insights into the captain's log and it, it's related to the body farm, but I, have you thought of, um, or are you planning on using it as a kind of an ongoing strategy in your practice? Is it going to be perhaps used in other bodies of works that you're, um, you might create in the future? Um, writing and images um, is so hard. That I'm sure that any future work that I would make would have some sort of imaginative narrative. Yeah. Whether it's the captain's log or not. Yeah. I mean, 
amazing. And then I guess maybe one last question, this one for, um, for Bruce. Um, I guess this kind of goes back to the whole online question because you've, mm. you've kind of shown us the progression of, um, of works uh, through the years. Uh, it's, it's really exciting that you've been exploring the media of painting through digital means that very recently. Um, mm. What influenced you to make the switch and what really has it changed your way of approaching painting uh, in more traditional, more traditional painting? Oh yeah, big time. Um, the inspiration for the switch was uh, basically getting locked down. Um, I was in, I'm in, currently in Stratford, Ontario, sheltering in place here. I uh, was working at the uh, at the festival as an actor, and uh, they basically sent us home one day, and the next thing we were know we were locked in place. And yeah. so I was no, I sort of had to shelve my performing arts career and went back to portrait painting. But how do you do this? And it just seemed like Zoom had popped up right away, so everyone was on Zoom, and and I just basically uh, out of necessity, I guess, being the mother of invention, I I started doing that. And you know, it's it's interesting, kind of coming back to talking about the. The, the sort of micro and the macro at the same time. I mean, the digital platform allows me to go all over the world. Um, and at the same time, um, I'm connecting more closely with, you know, my downstairs neighbors and the people across the street, uh, even though we can't sit together and have portrait sessions, but it seems like my roots have suddenly grown very quickly locally, which is very exciting, um, but on a global scale as well. So I feel uh, I'm kind of undergoing a bit of whiplash through it all. Yeah. Uh, grateful for it but yeah it's uh it's fascinating and and how it's affected the painting i mean i'm I'm no longer using uh squishy tactile beautiful fun paint anymore it's all digital so you know it's just a, a stylus on a on a screen and even though they tr they try to approximate the feeling of pressure point it's just not the same as getting your thumb in a big thing of acrylic paint uh However, it's it's not nearly as messy, which is a real bonus when you're renting. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that. Um, okay, I think we're about um, we we kind of have to wrap up at this point. So um, to conclude, I think I'd like to really thank once again everyone who appreciated uh, who appreciated these talks, all of the um, speakers who decided to join us today, Claire um, Yao. Karina um, in absence, but still with us, Bruce, Alejandro, um, and thank you for sharing your insights with us, your willingness and everything was very, um, made a success of this program. Um, I'm sure our audience will be very eager to find out more about your practices as well. Um, and we'll all be looking for opportunities to see your work in person, hopefully in the coming days or coming months. Um, I'd like to thank you, Jane, for your help with orchestrating this virtual event uh, and with your immense support with all the logistics that this involved. And lastly, um, I'd like to thank our audience for your participation and we hope that you've enjoyed um, this session today. Thank you, Laura. And thank you to all of our panelists for participating today. I hope everyone enjoyed this panel. Uh, once again, I would like to remind everyone that this webinar will be available tomorrow on our YouTube channel. And you can find more information on this as well as any of our other programming at www.torontooutdoor.art slash schedule. Uh, be sure to also join us this afternoon, Thursday, July 9th at 3.30 p.m. on our Instagram Live for our award ceremony. You can find us at, at Toronto Outdoor Art. Thank you everyone for attending this webinar and I really hope you enjoy the rest of this, year, this year's online fair. Thanks, take care. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.